You come here to have fun. Wee! You also come for one thing more. I'll pay you a Chipotle bowl, and Jake will pay for the chips. And of course, the hard-hitting questions. Hard to ask any of us that question. <laughs> Correct. It's for Tito and Seymour, Wednesdays from 4 to 5 on Blaze Radio, Blaze Radio Online. And we're here, live at Radio Row for Tito and Seymour, KSC, Blaze Radio Seems like it was just yesterday, starting off in Bill Austin Radio Studio, and now we find ourselves amongst the, the big ones, the professionals here at Radio Row. Gentlemen, welcome in, Noah Furtado, Ryan Sikora, Jake Seymour. Yeah, it's pretty cool, isn't it? We I mean, Jake, you're a kid in a candy shop right now. You just, you've been dreaming <laughs> of coming here since you were, what, like two and a half months? This is right up, this is right up my alley. I mean, he's, he's about 15 paces away from NBC Sports Boston. We got NBC Sports Regular, Fox Sports, Jim Rome. Willie Bloomquist is here, as well as a couple of Sun Devil Athletics folks, so... It's the big dogs, ain't it? It's the big league, isn't it? The energy just feels a tick different from Jake right now. <laughs> like that's that's <laughs> yeah. all I want to say is like just keep your eyes on Jake Seymour for the next hour and a half, two hours. It's gonna be a show. Top of the hour, we got Bill Willie Bloomquist coming on ASU head baseball coach. But let's just kind of kick it off. We'll stick here with Radio Roll for a moment here because you look around. We come in here, and yesterday was the whole credentialing process for us. We had to go pick up our credentials and. It was quite the experience going through it. We went through the NFL fan experience a little bit. Didn't see the whole behind-the-scenes portion <laughs> of it, but went through the fan security, walked around Phoenix trying to find those credentials, and I guess we made it, right, because we did find our way onto this table, and we get here, we're roaming around trying to find our table, and sure enough, here we are up and running, ready to go. Yeah, somehow they gave us credentials is yeah, what somehow. I was asking myself. I mean, <laughs> Noah, Noah's big time, you know, so of course Noah got one, but Jake and I were able to steal them. Um, producer Mallory, producer Zach, they got theirs as well, so... We're all cooking right now. It was, it was fun yesterday. It's going to be even more fun today, and we're here, what, rest of the week pretty rest much until week, Sunday? So it's going to be a fun week. We might not have gotten the, like, the Super Bowl experience or whatever. What's the official name? I don't know. I don't know. I saw everyone posted but, about it. We but is know. this not the ultimate fan experience? When oh, you're yeah. just here, you can like just redefine what a fan is. You can just be in this atmosphere. It's, it's uh, excellent. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing better. I mean, we're hoping – throughout the week that we can get some players on, some people on, some more media personalities, give you guys an opportunity to really peek behind the curtain, not only of what our show can be, but also Radio Row. See who's around, see who's about, maybe some social media content. It's going to be a full week, I mean, especially for Blaze. I mean, right now going on in Blaze Sports, please stay with us. But we're doing the Waste Management Phoenix Open as well. Fuel for Thought, Cooper Burns, Henry Dominey, Eric List, and we're going to have shows there every single day as well. So... It's packed. Everything on Twitter blazes the spot to be this week. You combine that all with the play-by-play calls on the Mixler channels. We're going to try. We're doing pretty good for ourselves, uh, Blaze Radio is. But let's kind of stick it here with the Super Bowl for a moment. Sunday, yesterday, teens flew in, landed in it. We got all the pictures, everyone coming in. And, I mean, no, I mean let's just start off with it. We're going to save our picks, obviously, towards the end of the week. <laughs> but exactly, we got we got to keep them on the edge, right? But let's just kind of start off here for a moment. I mean, what are, we, what are our initial takeaways heading into this? Oh, man. There's so many different storylines at play right now. There's the fact that you have Patrick Mahomes, Jalen Hurts, two MVP candidates going at it, two black quarterbacks that a lot of people have, have talked about that again and again and again, and it is valid. It's, it's a very cool first to have, and obviously the teams, both of them, um, they've both earned this. I think the Chiefs, it kind of just feels like they're here again, you know, it may, may not be as special as it is for Philadelphia where you look at that franchise and the arc that they've been on this past year in the offseason, the moves that they made, in not just in the draft, but being able to pick up a guy like A.J. Brown. You, they really made a move right, to take advantage of the talent that they have on this roster. And obviously the guy under center, Jalen Hurts, the, the leadership that he has injected into that locker room has been I don't know. Has it been unexpected? It I think been. to a certain extent it has. And, no, you bring up the point about how it feels like the Chiefs are kind of just back here, right? Although they did yeah. have that year gap. But it feels like the Eagles has been so long since they've been in a Super Bowl. And, really, it's only been five Super Bowls yeah. since they won their last Super it's Bowl Nick against Foles. the New England yeah, Patriots no. and Nick Foles. So, like, you look at that and it feels like for the Eagles in a sense it's like they're, it's been so long, but they're also back again. But it's an entirely new team. New coach, Nick Sirianni, new quarterback. And that new quarterback is the key for me. Noah mentions how surprising it was. I think the – extent to which Hertz has been exceptional and playing at an MVP level as a quarterback is surprising, but anyone who knew what Jalen Hurts was knew he was going to walk into the locker room day one and galvanize it and be the guy and be the leader by example, by word of mouth, everything. Everyone knew he had the leadership qualities. Where he has excelled has been the actual quarterback play, and 
when you have a lot of those leadership qualities and all the rumors about Hurts is at Oklahoma, dog, workhorse. Alabama, dog, workhorse. I've never really seen Saban praise a quarterback for their work ethic like he did with Jalen Hurts. So you almost kind of inevitably knew Hurts is going to get better because everything Hurts is bad at, he's going to realize it and he's going to fix it and he's going to figure it out. And he's already got the leadership qualities. So that's kind of the thing is you don't expect it because you – don't think a guy who was drafted in the position Hurts was and didn't always have the greatest throwing motions and the greatest ability as a quarterback to be in this spot. But all the qualities, on the, the chip on the shoulder, the leadership, the mental stuff, kind of leads you to very easily feel, figure out why Jalen Hurts has led the Eagles and this offense to this spot. There was a clip, I think it was from his draft interview with the Eagles, mm -hmm. right, that got leaked on social media. And there was one thing that he said in that interview that stuck out to me that says, Okay, yeah, that makes sense as to why he is where he is right now. It was leaders don't just lead. It's the people who they lead that let them. Or yeah. It was something along those lines, not verbatim, but that, that sentiment right right there is exactly the mindset that you see Hurts have in that locker room and, and why it has led to the results that it is. Now they're in the Super Bowl. And it really is just one of those stories where everyone looked at this team preseason and said they're a very good team. But they got to compete in the NFC East. There's a couple other factors going on in that division. And all, all of a sudden for them, not only to dominate the regular season as they did, but to come out of the NFC as a whole. I mean, we look at this. We we were saying a couple, few weeks ago, this is San Francisco's uh, conference to lose. We thought San Francisco was going to do it. And then, of course, they get their injury with Brock Purdy. Uh, you know, obviously everything else that goes on with Garoppolo and Lance. But you look at this, and it almost feels like, the Eagles shouldn't be here. And the fact that they're here, it kind of just means a little bit more to them. And it's cool for the city, right? And Philadelphia, Jake, you talk often about Boston and how that's a city who wears their heart on their sleeve through sports vicariously. Philadelphia's the same way. And for them to be back in this for the second time in what is about five, six years, it's the same feeling. It's everybody's in, everybody's climbing up poles, and everybody's going <laughs> to be everywhere all the time. It's it's the, how the city works, and it's cool. And that's kind of why the Eagles are able to have that jolt of success because when they're good, the city gets behind them, and they are good. You saw that this year with, with the baseball team and even with some of the other teams over the past couple of years. When the Sixers are good, they're good. When the Phillies are good, they're good. The city gets behind them. It's, it's how Philadelphia works, and I'm excited to see them take over the city of Phoenix this week because Kansas City travels well. Philadelphia travels exceptionally. Now we're going to take a break here. Before we go to break, let's toss over to Ryan for 90-second sports update. 90-second sports update? You want seconds. me to do it? I mean – well, let's talk about Tom Brady. After calling it a career just about a week ago, Tom Brady announcing today live on the Herd, Colin Cowherd's radio show, that he's going to take a year off, hang out with family after that was a much maligned process a year ago where it seemed like family wasn't at the forefront of his mind. Now it very much is. So he's going to hang out with his family for a year, and then he's going to join the Fox broadcast in 2024. And then, of course, the big news, the big, big news. Over the weekend, Kyrie Irving traded to the Dallas Mavericks. He's on his way to Dallas. In return, Spencer did win a good secondary option for the Mavs, as well as Dorian Finney-Smith, their best perimeter defender, a first-rounder in 2029. Guys, they're drafting LeBron James Jr.'s kid in 2029. That's a long time away, a couple second-rounders as well, all that sort of not too big a deal. But, of course, Kyrie Irving going to Dallas will always be both an eye raiser, a head scratcher, every adjective you can use. Kyrie Irving to Dallas. We're going to talk about that on the other side of this commercial break. from Radio Row. Welcome back in. Willie Bloomquist joining us at the top of the hour, but let's kind of go back a little bit into uh, Kyrie Irving traded over the weekend, and Ryan mentioned it at the top of the hour, all the details into that. But, I mean, no, no let's just start with the details here. Kyrie Irving going to Dallas, meeting with Luka Doncic. I mean, what are our initial takeaways heading into this? I don't like it. Um, and the reason for it is very simple. I understand that to a certain extent you saw success when Kyrie Irving, James Harden, and Kevin Durant were playing together, but – Toward the end of that, you didn't see that sort of same sort of camaraderie. And it, it's not even really anything that I'm trying to, to say about their off-court chemistry. It's just the kind of player that Kyrie is, the 
kind of player that Harden is, that it didn't mesh well it, when it was all said and done. Kyrie needs the ball, ball dominant player. James Harden was the same way, and and what is Luka Doncic, if anything? He's the ball most dominant. dominant player exactly. in the league. Exactly. So I, it, you know, from a play style perspective, having two superstars is great, but at the same time, the way that those two work together, I I don't necessarily see how well how how that's the best fit for for a guy like Kyrie when you're trying to when you're trying to get Kyrie Irving, you're trying to get him plop him in a place where he's going to thrive and essentially get you over the top. And it doesn't feel that way. It feels like the Mavericks are like just doing something just to show that hey, look, we're trying to get help and that people have picked up on that, but it, it's not enough. Like you want to make sure that you're making these moves strategically and I don't know how much of that was taken into account. Kyrie Irving, you know, a lot of star power, but as far as how he how he's going to want to play alongside Luka doesn't necessarily bode well for how Luka wants to play. What gets me about this trade is that if you look at this, when I think of Luka Doncic, I think of this gritty, kind of just do it all at the same time, winner player, right? This okay. is a guy who's been playing professional basketball since he was, what, 14 or something in Europe, in the Euro Leagues, right? This is a guy who I just think is like a workhorse in a lot of ways, right? And we can talk about his play style mm -hmm. and sense how he's ball dominant and maybe that doesn't translate into success. But you pair him up with someone like Kyrie Irving, who is kind of just... I mean, like realistically, if you look at his career, with the exception of twenty of twenty sixteen, what has he done? He's been in Boston. He ch he was hurt in the time that Boston made it to the conference finals, right? And then he ends up forcing his way out of there. Then he goes to Brooklyn, and now we're sitting here three years removed from that signing period, and he's done the same thing. And not to mention, you go back and look at it. And we were talking this with friend of the program, Peyton Gallagher, <laughs> before he came over, is that the Brooklyn Nets were a game seven win away from going to the finals, and they didn't do it. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I'm looking at this, and I'm like. What is it? What was the benefits here for Dallas? You're already not the best defending team. You get rid of your best defender. You get rid of a really good piece of Spencer Dinwiddie for a four-month rental of Kyrie Irving. And I think the idea is they're in win-now mode and they're recognizing that. And the idea is by adding a second guy who's going to put the ball in the bucket, which is at the end of the day the name of the game, right? They can do that at a more efficient rate and have a better chance of winning. And taking it from Dallas and the GM perspective, let's say, is – you're getting Kyrie Irving for, let's look at the picks, a, a, a first rounder in 2029. So that is six years down the road. So they're going to be drafting someone who's currently maybe an eighth grader yeah. right now at the youngest and a, 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 a senior or sophomore in high, high school. school at the oldest. So they're toggling between that. So that's way far in the future. That's a pick that might change hands another five times probably before will. we actually get there. And probably will because of the nature of how picks are used in the association nowadays. Especially with Brooklyn. Especially with Brooklyn. A couple of seconds. The players are where you focus on it. And it's Dinwiddie who's had a good kind of subtle resurgence this year. He's continued to grow in, in his role in Dallas. And Finney Smith, who has been a brilliant defender on the wing, their best perimeter guy, he's their best defender. So that's probably the bigger loss for me is losing DFS. But you gain Kyrie Irving. I think they win the trade from a pure perspective of basketball talent. You give away a couple of picks and a couple of talented basketball players to gain one of the five most talented basketball players in the league right now at his peak. And when he plays well, he, no, he's unstoppable. What you lose and you, what you question with Kyrie is will he play well, will he fit, and that's where I think a lot of people are losing it. And if he doesn't play well, you let him go, you come back in free agency. But that in lies the other problem. There's nobody in this next free agency class. You're looking at Chris Middleton. You're looking at D'Angelo Russell. You're looking at Kyrie Irving. There isn't a big market out there for you to want to go pay someone a max contract. It's going to be a struggle. The best guy they can get in free agency is going to be Chris Middleton, who's going to be probably the best fit with Luka because he's off the ball, kind of catch-and-shoot guy. But at the same time, too, is, is Chris going to leave Milwaukee? Probably not. And Chris also injury issues. There's a lot of injury stuff there, and he's getting older. We don't really know where that's going to go his career-wise. So – if Chris Middleton's your best option in this next free agency class, I think you call it a wash. You don't want to give anybody in this free agency class a max contract, and Milwaukee can give them more money, as Jake is trying to bring up. Yeah, and Milwaukee can give them more money because of that homegrown talent rule where you they want the NBA wants players to stay with their teams. But, Ryan, you mentioned with Luka the, in the Mavericks, they're in win-now mode. Luka's 23 years old. Yeah. That doesn't scream win-now mode to me. Yeah, it does to me now in the NBA with how much talent there is around there. Yeah, and I don't I don't see Luka just kind of how these European players are is that they are not they don't come up in the AAU circuit where it's, <laughs> okay, this AAU team's playing poorly. I'm going to jump ship and go play for this team, and I'm going to jump ship again, and they do it four more times, right? That's just how the nature of it now, right? 
Luca was a guy who kind of just stayed with one team, worked his way up, and then made his way to the NBA. So I don't see, I don't see the 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 risk of him of leaving. I don't see that flight. Uh, I mean, do you see? I don't see him leaving Dallas at all or forcing his way out. I I just let's let's stay away from Luca because Luca is going to be in Dallas, right? I I think. That is like a constant we can hold for this Mavericks team, and the reason they're trying to make moves is to make that time most productive. Okay, Kyrie. The, let me just add some more background here. Why did Kyrie work in Brooklyn Wait, when they were successful? Why did he work? I thought it was because when you have Kevin Durant, who's another superstar, right, who can play well off the ball and doesn't need to bring it up the court every single possession, that bodes well for a guy like Kyrie. Right, because it doesn't need to be. You don't have to cut the ball in half. You know what I mean? You can actually have the ball pop around and have Kyrie find his spots without Kevin Durant, you know, possessing the ball. I guess you could say for half of the shot clock or even more than that. Now it's different, right? It's two superstars to two superstars, but now the the top guy, right, isn't Kevin Durant? It's Luka Doncic, yeah. right? Now to Jake's point, you're saying that. Why would they do something like this? Because Luca is 23. He is almost guaranteed to be there for a good amount of time more. And this doesn't really push them forward, right? Am yeah, I hearing I you correctly? I just don't think Luca is even a flight risk either. That's the other thing. Is that you're going to have this I think guy everybody's a flight risk, though. I don't think, it, I don't think with, with Luca you have to worry about like that. Is it solely because of that European DNA, I that think background? I think that's how he was brought up and played yeah. it, through the circuit in, in Europe like that. I think anybody who is a generational talent on a team that's underperforming or could be underperforming is a flight risk. And I think Dallas is trying their best, their darndest, to get him a guy that's like a signal of, we're gonna get you what you want to su- what you need and what you want to succeed here. Like we're gonna try. Well, we and don't do know if you wanted Kyrie. To this do. feels symbolic in some ways, though. Like we're gonna go get a star. You know why? Because we have Luca and we want him to be here and we want him to be happy and we want him to chase. That's what it kind of felt like to me. It looks more optical, though. Yeah. Yeah. That. It's it's not necessarily like something with substance. I I feel like they're doing it because they wanted to show something. Right. That's it. I. Because there were people talking about Kyrie Irving and, you know, the fact that he was going to move somewhere, right, how leading up to it his stock was rising because Brooklyn was, I think, their their fourth right now in the Eastern Conference. They were playing well. And just generally, Kyrie moving to another team would add value, right? Mm -hmm. But by them doing this, this franchise in particular, it just feels like they're going going with the flow of the narrative. It's just Kyrie Irving is a good pickup. Pick pick him up. Oh, he, they got him. This, where is this narrative, though? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Is that where, where does narratives come from? I think there's so many. I think the narrative often comes from whoever matters, whoever gets in Mark Cuban's ear, whoever gets in anybody's ear. And yeah, and that's fair. But if you go back and look at Dallas's previous seasons, right, they go, they get Dinwiddie, you go further back, they even got Porzingis. And New now GM. Porzingis wasn't the guy, but, of course, they went out and did that symbolic thing to try and get some help. New GM. That's another thing to look at is new GM trying to make maybe his own move, his stamp. And we talked about it again with a couple people. And Mark Cuban is a smart guy. Like, this doesn't feel like a move that Mark Cuban would have made to go get a guy like Kyrie Irving, who, while being absurdly talented, is almost just as volatile as he is talented. It's got just as much likelihood to blow up in your face as it does to work. And that doesn't feel like a move that Mark Cuban, a savvy businessman, would make. That being said, Mark Cuban's a savvy businessman. He's going to put people in place that he trusts, right? right. And maybe he trusts this guy. He's not going to hire a GM that he doesn't trust. So his GM is going to have basketball say because Cuban's going to trust him. And all of a sudden when this GM comes out and pushes and says, hey, Kyrie Irving, here's the deal. You've got that opportunity. You can go for it. And Mark Cuban's going to trust him. Let's not keep out of here. The other one, another one of the most well-run organizations in the NBA, the Phoenix Suns recently under James Jones, there's heavy, heavy reports that, There was a legitimate package including Chris Paul and Jay Crowder and a couple of picks to go get Kyrie. Good, healthy organizations on the optical outside perspective wanted this guy. And that's kind of the weird thing to me is I wouldn't touch Kyrie with a 10-foot pole. You wouldn't touch him with a 45-foot pole. Noah, you're probably somewhere around my ballpark at 10. But these organizations wanted him. That's what surprises me. This move to me just feel it doesn't feel like a big market Dallas Maverick, Mark Cuban move. It just feels like this is like a a small market like a like a Charlotte Hornets move. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like that just like small middle of the road like an Oklahoma Charlotte City. Charlotte Hornets. Like catching that's, a stray. Like is you know wild. what I, you know what I mean? Like it just doesn't feel like a move that a big market team like Dallas would, would make. 
Well, I mean, how much better does this make them? Right now, they're six in the Western Conference. Okay, they're behind the Phoenix Suns, the Clippers, the Kings. Wow. <laughs> if I said the Kings are third in the Western like Conference the before the season began, would you be like, I'm crazy? Yeah, yeah yes. probably. probably. Grizzlies, Nuggets, right? So I don't think this move puts them, you know, past any one of those teams before the season's out, yeah. right? And it might even drop them a peg or two when you look at, you know, teams like the Warriors. I mean, they they might be going on the downhill even with, without Curry. Well, the Curry. Steph injury, stuff like that exactly. is huge. But when you have other teams that are going to be making pushes, right, you're essentially inter you're it feels like they're interrupting, right? The the flow of how this team has gone for however many games it's been. It's been too many games, I feel like, to make a move like this. When you move Finney Smith, Dinwiddie, big rotational guys, dropping a superstar who at least from the outside looking in, does not appear to be the right fit alongside Luka Doncic, I think it could it could lead to a slide. Right? At at the very most it's gonna be Still, the sixth place Dallas Mavericks in the Western Conference. Yeah, and that's that's probably the the big end be all end all here. Yeah, and we will get back on this after Willie comes on. We'll take a second here. We'll just reset, talk about some ASU baseball. We'll take a break here. We'll be right back. Don't leave. Oh, I guess I'm doing it again. Here we go. No, so, am I not doing it again? What do you want me to do? Tell I thought me. we were going to break. We're going to break. Am I reading? There we go. I don't want to read it. I just read it. We'll go to break. You ever wondered how you could get paid to watch sports or like work in sports? Yeah, bro. I just got done listening to this podcast with Austin Scott, Jeffrey Hingle, and Hayden Silly. No way, bro. Yeah, bro. And it's right before NFL kickoff. No way, bro. That's right. Tune in to How To Sports every Sunday from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. What's going on, everyone? It's Daniel Pike, the host of Good Takes Only, live on Blaze Radio, 1030 every Thursday. Each week, I give my takes on the latest NBA and NFL topics, well joined by athletes, journalists, and insiders. Make sure to tune in. Introducing the three chuckleheads of Triple Threat. Hi, I'm Harris Hicks, and I have a girlfriend named Stats. I love going on dates with her to KenPalm.com. And I'm Keith Dotley, and I have an unnatural obsession for pronouncing long names and the Southern Conference. And I'm Tyler Conrad. I hate Stats. Yes, that was a shot at Harris. Listen to Triple Threat for the best college basketball comedy and analysis. Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Arizona time on Blaze Radio. Every player wants to be the best on the court. Again, Radio Row here in downtown Phoenix. Some breaking news going on. We don't have the breaking news sound, but we can pretend like we just played one. Breaking news, KSC Blaze Radio. Brian Flores, Vikings defensive coordinator now. And I, I, we, we've always kind of talked on this show that Brian Flores is one of the, one of the better coaches in the NFL. I don't think that's a stretch to say, say. I think we can all kind of agree mm-hmm. on that, right? Um, are we surprised that it took this long, like a full year from the Miami Dolphins situation? It took a full year for him to get a job. No, but what I am surprised about, and let's twist to the Arizona angle here, he's not a Cardinal. And that's the big news, is this comes after the Cardinals kind of, it got rumored around that they had their final three. And Brian Flores was among their final three candidates for the Cardinals' job. So e- one of two things happened. He wasn't one of the final three candidates, or really they have it down to two. Or Brian Flores got tired of sitting and waiting around and said, I'm just going to take a job that I know I can have fun with. And the Vikings are a good team. I'd want to go be the uh, defensive coordinator for Minnesota because that gives me a chance to have success. They've got a good offense. You pair that with a good defense, you got a ring. That's kind of the mindset there. The Cardinals waited around. They didn't get Peyton. They didn't get D'Amico Ryans. And now they don't get Brian Flores, who was among their top three. It looks like they're going to have to settle for Lou Anarumo or however you say his last name, the Cincinnati Bengals, D.C. But 
That's the big takeaway from that to me is that he is not the head coach of the Arizona Cardinals yep. the day after it was rumored, mass reported, that he was one of the three finalists for that job. And if you're a finalist for a head coaching job in the NFL, you stick around and you wait usually. He didn't. And I'm presuming, Jake, you mean a big job. So a coordinator spot yeah. or a head coaching job. Like like that is where we feel well, – I'm not going to speak for you guys, but we, I feel that Brian Flores will un end up again one day. But he's been – you know. And a little stint with the Steelers, mm -hmm. linebackers coach. Yeah. So, you know, he's working his way up. I, it's unfortunate that it had to work out that way. But one day, like this this is not the be all end all for, for Brian Flores. No, Make no mistake, not. right? He is he is making his way back to getting an opportunity to be an be a head coach again. Just the way this whole situation and story developed at first, yeah. it seemed like it was gonna take Flores years <laughs> to get his way back up to even be in, in the in a finalist position. So I think it's a it's a more so just a kudos to him about his coaching ability and his ability just to lead a football team, right? But I can't believe that it, it went to Minnesota, especially if that Cardinals job was on the table. And I think really quickly about what you mentioned, that you thought it might take years. I think what it speaks to is coaching talent matters in interviews. And if you present yourself as a talented head coach through track record, through interview, you will get a job. I think that's kind of my takeaway from that is – it didn't take as long as many people thought it might because Brian Flores is so well known to be very gifted in the way he thinks the game, the way he leads men in the game. And that's, I think, maybe the key there is that he's a guy. He's a dude. We knew that. And that's why the process was sped up. And now he's got a big time job again. And of course, people had argued maybe he shouldn't have been let go. Yes, right? of course. And Mike, of course. Mike McDaniel, he, he's pick, picked up his own traction, right? His own his own supportive mm -hmm. fan base in this last year. But uh, there's been that sort of feel around Brian Flores. It's like he, he, he's a head coach. He's just not in, the, in, in that kind of role because of a lot of different circumstances. Yeah, and th it's a good point on McDaniel. Yeah. It, is it's worked out in Miami, at least at its base. We'll see where it goes next year. We'll see what happens with Feels the like quarterback room. Feels like they've got a room. buffer now. But it does feel like it was kind of a good decision in terms of the Dolphins to – go where they went. They had a quarterback. They wanted an offensive-minded guy to lead their quarterback. Tua showed massive improvements at times this year. He just needs to stay healthy. And if Tua doesn't come back, then, well, they'll need to do it again. But, yeah, I think it, it's – I'm glad that Brian Flores was not withheld from the league for obvious reasons, the lawsuit, stuff like that. There was not a black mark, a, r a piece of red tape across Brian, Brian Flores' name that as soon as it came up from law firm searches, the GM or – the owner would scratch it off. Yeah, and that was just kind of, I mean, we had talked about this. I remember when it happened a year ago, we were on the air for it, and that was what was disheartening to me is the fact that this very talented coach mm. all of a sudden went from a head coach because he had, it seemed like he had a disagreement about the quarterback situation, gets fired, and then all of a sudden he can't even get a, not, let alone a head coaching job. Yeah, he was on he the NFL blacklist. Job. Yeah. Like, he literally got blackballed from the NFL in a lot of ways. And, it, you, know, thank, you know, Mike Tomlin was able to pick him up, put him on his staff, and now he's able to find a coordinator job again. Yeah. But yeah. I wonder now it's like, how much longer until he gets back to the head coaching position? Like, how much? How, like, what's the timetable on that now? It, uh, I think it's wholeheartedly dependent on what Minnesota looks like next year. And I would be scared of a Minnesota team that I think was really good in close games. Obviously, they, we all knew it was going to kind of – eventually they were going to run out of this steam, and it did in that game against the Giants. But he adds an element to them. He makes them a legitimate contender next year, especially if they do the offseason right from beyond this point. And one good year for a guy with his track record – can go a long way. It might be two, it might be three if they struggle a little bit, but I think eventually he's getting in circles already. He's going to stay in circles for the foreseeable future. Eventually, one team will hit on him, and he'll hit on them, and it'll be a match. The consensus is it's inevitable. Yeah, yeah. It's not if. You'd it's have when. to hope it's when and not if. I yeah. Like you'd have to think so, right? Yes, of course. I, Brian Brian Flores deserves to be a head coach in this league, and. You know, for this time, when he's being an assistant, when he when he's on Tomlin's staff, and now he's headed over to Minnesota, it, it just feels like those are like, it's like, just a convenience almost for for the head coaches of those franchises because to have a guy as talented as Flores, who is essentially a head coach and assistant in an assistant's position, right? They're they're just basically going to try and ride it out as much as uh, as much as possible until you know finally a team takes a chance on him. Yeah, well, we'll have that one on the table now to discuss later on. Let's kind of shift gears a little bit to ASU baseball. Head coach, ASU head coach, Willie Bloomquist joining us at the top of the hour. I mean, Noah, this is a team that you covered extensively last season. Um, you know, what was just your, your takeaways, in your opinion, from 
the very start of, of last of the end of last season to right where we are now. They just had a full off season to mm. go in and and bring in dudes. That that's the essence of how this program feels. Uh, the situation it's in ahead of Willie Bloomquist's second season in Phoenix. Essentially, when you can have all that time to go and evaluate and have essentially access to the entire pool of transfers, yeah. high school recruits, even high school recruits, they're kind of late in the game, but but they still may do. And and by the way, in addition to the transfer overhaul that is in uh, that is at ASU right now, they've got potentially three freshmen that could start at skill positions. It, it's they feel like they have a lot more to go on, and, and he, he's, I think, settling in a little bit. And he, I, When we talk to him a little bit, we'll get more of those answers from him directly, but that is essentially how it looks, you know what I mean, at this point in time with the players they got on paper. And he's made that clear. It's on paper. Yeah. Doesn't really – no, nothing's really say. known. Uh, my bad. No, you're okay. <laughs> we don't have <laughs> – Sets me up. We didn't have the telepathic there. But um, it, it just feels like they're ready to go and they have their team. It, it felt like they were throwing guys, you know, in different spots, putting the pieces together you know, last minute, scrambling. And, and mm -hmm. right now, it's a lot more yeah. just methodical, operational, whatever word you want to put to it, it just feels a lot more comfortable right now. Um, even even though the results aren't there, it's it feels like they're, they're rearing up to it. I think the word I'd use is it feels more complete. Yeah. It yeah. feels like there's an idea, and... In fairness, last year I think Willie got a lot of crap because of what happened and how underperforming they were because that team had some talent. They shouldn't have been where they were. But what that team lacked, I think, from an outward perspective was depth. They didn't have a lot of that. This team has depth. It's got guys. It's got arms everywhere. And it feels complete. It's tough to parachute into a season as a first-time coach at a level, not necessarily fully know what you're doing. You've got to map it out as you go along. You didn't have the time to recruit, to, to recruit transfers, to recruit kids. Now he does. Now his roster feels more complete. They feel like they have more options. I know the pitching coach, Sam Peraza, is very excited about having all these options. And they've got a couple of big ones we're going to talk to him about Ross Dunn and New Condrades in just a moment. That's the key for me is this feels like a more put-together version of what they wanted to do last year. And you talked about the depth. That was the word that they kept throwing around at Media Day was depth. Yeah. We've got depth. We've got depth. We can go. We don't have to throw away games in the third inning if a pitcher's performed poorly or even the first inning if a pitcher comes out and gives up six runs. You can fight their way back into games. I'm very curious to see because I think it's a team that is got a different little feel about it coming in the next year, and Willie will tell us all about it when he gets here. Yeah, and I think the big thing, and you mentioned it with the arms, is that they really only had two starting pitchers last year <laughs> that they used you know, extensively, and it was rotation guys on the Sunday and midday stretches. But with this team, I mean – you know, when we talked to Sam Peraza at Media Day uh, just a few weeks ago, it was, it was you know, the, the message was not only do we have enough arms just to be able to be a complete rotation, we've got so much depth now. Is, is that that's kind of was their message, that we've, we've got the depth now. So it's uh, going to allow them to maybe uh, be able to, if someone gets hurt, now all of a sudden their weekend isn't over. They have a little bit of uh, momentum to go with. Well, look, man, one thing we have to keep in mind is that team had talent in the lineup, I thought. There, there was – there was guys who could who could really hit the ball, play play well in the field. That like they're losing a guy like Joe Lampy in center field, which I think is a massive loss. They're not going to be able to replace him at least not right away. I think the the difference right when you want to get sp specific right beyond just the depth is they have it looks like they have more pitching this year. That they're not going to want to be in a situation where they give up six runs, where they don't have a pitcher go into the fifth inning. Things of that nature were too often the case with last year's team, and I think if they can make considerable improvements pitching-wise, that team, right, from last year, because how much better are they going to get from a hitting standpoint, yeah. from a fielding standpoint from last year? I think mm -hmm. it, it's marginal at best, but the pitching, that I think is the independent variable here that is going to elevate this program. And so three, three quick hitters for you. Like, first one, Ryan Campos was obviously kind of the guy who had to step up at times last year. Is there another jump for him? He had a great summer in the Cape, and that was well talked about during the media offseason. Is there a jump there for him? And also, stay with the hitters, stay with the guys that are going to get the bat. Ethan Long, he's healthy. He's talked extensively about that. Is there a new update to Ethan Long in terms of that health factor that's going to push him 
further and further into, an, into a stratosphere that we expected him to be at at this point in his time in his career at ASU. It's not as if Ethan Long isn't as talented as he's always been. Mm -hmm. it, it's more of the mental component, okay. right? When you're, when you're talking to him, he feels a lot more grounded, right? I think he was coming off of a freshman year in which, you know, he, he, was, he was sky high, right? That, that freshman year was unlike anything most had ever seen, right? Whoever's watching ASU baseball, they didn't see that very often at all. And the sophomore season, the sophomore slump, if you want to call it that, obviously the injuries got in the way, but I feel like that has been able to give him perspective, right, in terms of how he's going to take things day by day, right, little by little, and it's, it doesn't feel like I as much pressure, I think you could say, for a guy like Ethan who's going to be trying to, I think it's a lot easier to try and mount a comeback as opposed to try and build off of a freshman season, let's say, right, that you know, how much better are you going to get than that? I, I think that was, at least from an outsider's point of view, right, you can never get into his head. But as far as, you know, how it looks, that's how it feels. You talk about the pressure, and, it, and this is just for any sport, not just in this situation, but it's just across the board is that I'm a firm believer you can't judge a coach in his first year. You just can't. you got to give it time. Yeah. Unless if it's, like, atrociously bad, and, he's, you know, like, and you know it's a coaching thing, which this situation was not that, right? But if you – I just don't think you can judge Willie in his first year, right? And what – Something I'm looking at is that how does Willie take what happened in that first year and build upon it to have a better and more successful second year? And that's something that once he can do that and he builds on that second year, and then you're doing that again in your third year, now all of a sudden you've built, you've built three consecutive years upward, and now you're starting to look at a program that's starting to find its identity, that solidified itself, and now the recruits are starting to come in, and now, now you're money. Like now, you're, you know, now you're working. You have to understand, too, Willie hadn't coached <laughs> baseball. Nope. At all before his first season. I, I'm, I'm sure people, most people know that, but for those who don't, that's a big detail, right? It's not even just the fact that they're bringing in more players because they had more time to do so. It's the fact that behind the scenes, maybe there's been a little bit of changes. There's been hints at that in terms of how things have been, I don't know, made more efficient, right? It's the little details day to day that, you know, Willie had a plan coming in when he was talking last year. He had a plan about how this team was going to operate, right? And the season is long, so you've got to have some sort of perspective on that going in. But obviously, it's not going to be a hit the, the, the first time you go through it, right? And so now he's got some trial and error under his belt. And, you know, that there still might be more of that, but just a little bit less than a season ago. Yeah, I, I, I guess I think the only other really thing that I have with this ASU baseball team is, is that Willie Bloomquist factor of first year as a head coach, there was, I'm certain, from, from a perspective of someone who – didn't watch the team as closely as you did, Noah. But I'm certain that there was I'm a sure lot of trust. Who did as much as Noah did. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Noah there till 4 a.m. every night. Two o'clock game in the afternoon. Noah's still there till 4 a.m. He's a grinder. Um, but th was there a lot more trust on Sam Peraza and the rest of that coaching staff last year? And will it kind of carry over into this year, or does Willie, with the experience he's gaining, is it more of just kind of a a nice ebb and flow of the coaching staff? I wonder what that'll look like. I, I think he always had that trust in Peraza. Yeah. Is that because Peraza, this isn't his first rodeo, right? Bloomquist brought in coaches that had the experience to kind of offset the fact that he was going through it the first time. You know what I'm saying? So he wasn't going to necessarily always, you know, be there and, and have to, ha like, monopolize the operation. Like, that's just not how he was going to go about it in his first season. I still don't think it's going to be that way, right? Because he is the overseer. He has guys like Peraza. He has Coach Goff, Buck, right? They have guys in place. It, it's a solid staff. It's just about now being able to take that next step with the talent in place. Because you got to understand that, especially from a pitching standpoint, there were times when they couldn't do anything else except leave the guy out there. Because speaking to your depth point, right, how deep that bullpen was, it well, however deep it was, <laughs> it was sunk by the fact that there were too many outings in which starting pitchers didn't go deep enough, right? It put a whole lot of pressure on that bullpen to perform too often, right? And so – You'd have an instance where, you know, how much more can the coach do except just watch his guy not throw strikes? They, they yeah. talked about that like almost every game, it feels like, the fact that they weren't able to find the strike zone, right? And now you have guys – it's it's not even a blow to who was on the staff last year. It's just the fact that they do now have guys who have proven – to be able to be a little bit more competent in that regard, to go and challenge hitters, right? And a guy like Ross Dunn talked about it. Yeah. He was like, he's throwing that heater mid-90s. He said his, his approach is go attack guys, right? And if that mentality can, can permeate 
through the entire staff, right? Because Ross Dunn, he, he's the anchor, or at least that's what Peraza wants him to be. That's the hope, and that's what we've and been told. Exactly. It's not just a rotation either. If that mentality can go through the entire team, now oh. all of a sudden you got a guy at the plate sure. who's aggressive and is in the mentality of, like, I'm the best guy here. I'm just going to hit the ball as far, far and as good as I can. Now it's like, okay, now you're looking at a team that – might have a little bit of extra juice in it. It's yeah. not just the pitching anymore. It's no longer, and maybe it's just more of a, okay, this guy's doing this. you got to match it. you got to do all these things. And that's coming with Ethan Long at the plate. It's coming with guys like Ross Dunn, who if he is the anchor, the idea, the mentality is throw strikes. That was the thing we always – that was another thing we kept hearing was they throw strikes, throw strikes, throw strikes. They're not going to pitch around kids. They're not going to try and get guys to swing at things. They're going to make you hit stuff. They are going to throw it. They're going to put it in there, and they're going to make it hard. And they've got the heat, man. They, they Christian Curtis is, is scheduled to be <laughs> the Saturday guy right now, and he he, he throws mid-90s as well. So they, they've really bolstered this staff to be able to go after guys. And obviously they, they've got nasty stuff. You asked Ryan Campos, what was his answer? He, he had to list the top three nastiest pitches. Dunn's fastball was one of them. Christian Curtis's changeup, not his fastball, not his 95-mile-per-hour fastball, his changeup. Right was listed on as, as part of that, and then Timmy Manning from Florida, his curveball, the lefty, right? And I think that's another thing that you got to keep in mind is they added a couple of lefties, two two that could be starters for them, right? So when you have that sort of balance, left left righty, it, it it feels like you have a little bit more to go on in terms of giving batters different looks, right? And there's all of that. I, I think they just really wanted to start by getting the best available guys who could fit into the culture, right? And that's something that Blomquist, he, he can speak to a little bit more, right? We'll, we'll let him do that. But in, in terms of what they're trying to build there, it's just about trying to find something within the team, right? Everyone doing their job. And it felt like there was too often times when certain guys had to be relied on to do other people's yeah. jobs because, well, you know, had bad outings or, or, you know, bad nights, whatever it was. Tee, tee up the listeners real quick. You guys are both going to cover the team this year. You're going to be there extensively. One big question for the coaching staff and the team as a whole this season. I'm just excited to see, I mean, this is an individual question, how Isaiah Jackson does this season. He really seems like a mature kid who is just a re really, really talented, even off the baseball field. So that's just something I'm looking forward to, seeing how his development goes through th this season. Very quickly, how this new slew of transfers is going to fit into the, the team's culture. They've talked about it, that it has, and now it's just going to have to be shown, you know, game to game. On the other side, William Bloomquist will be joining us here live from Radio Row. We'll catch you guys on the other side. Picado and Seymour live from Radio Row. ASU head baseball coach Willie Bloomquist joining us here. Willie, thanks for taking the time. How are you doing today? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. So, Coach, just kind of to start off, I mean, this is your second year coming into this, obviously, after the first year. I mean, what are just some things you're looking forward to now that you have a year under your belt? Uh, just uh, really, at this point, anxious for the season to start. You know, um, we, we've been been grinding it out and doing a lot of uh, a lot of things a little bit different than last year, you know, with, with what we learned from last year. And, um you know, I have a, a obviously a, a big, big group of uh, of new faces. You know, which we're which we're gelling together pretty well, and uh, anxious to see how these guys respond when the lights come on here a week from Friday. What's what's the feel? Does, does that does that sense a little bit different now? Because it maybe you were scrambling a little bit more t towards the beginning of the you know last season, and now it feels like you're a little bit more settled. What is the what is the sense there? Well, I think uh, you know. Last year, everything was was a first. You know that happened. It was a first for me, so uh, everything that happened was new, and I, I wasn't sure really what to expect. But uh, you know, coming into this year, it's a, it's um, not that I'm a seasoned veteran <laughs> by any means, but it's uh, it's at least I have an idea what to expect on stuff and, and understand that um, you know how to how to hopefully read body language a little bit better, how to read the, the personalities of our guys a little bit better, and you know when's the right time to to put some guys in the lineup when's the, the right time to get some guys out uh again this year we have a little bit more flexibility with that whereas last year you were playing whether you like it or not we don't have any other options so um you know it is what it is but you know this year we're we're excited about where we're going and um you know we, we got we're not there yet we, we got a lot of work to do still but i think uh we're in a good spot to 
to hopefully go out and, and perform much better. And you mentioned that word flexibility. We were just talking about it before you came on. The key word we kept throwing around was depth, and it's kind of in similar molds. Can you speak a little bit more about the new guys you brought in, the depth, the flexibility you've added to the roster? Oh, well, yeah, we, we started certainly with, with the pitching. You know, yeah. obviously that was a, a big concern for us last year with, with not a lot of options and, uh, you know, did – did, uh, looking back on it, I guess we did okay with what we had, you know, and, and guys competed hard and did well. We just didn't have, uh, we didn't have enough. And, you know, guys were out there with sore arms trying to pitch, and we just didn't have anybody else. But uh, we focused a, a large part of our offseason on bringing in some arms, some capable arms, guys with experience, um, you know, hopefully guys that, that can attack the strike zone uh, on a more frequent basis. And, um, you know, from a position player standpoint, we went after – uh, went after infielders. We know we were short quite a bit on infielders last year. We had an injury or two, and that really reared its head, you know, early on that, that man, we, we need some more depth here in the infield. And, and on the skin, we got to have guys that are, that are a little bit more athletic. And um, so those were the things we focused on primarily. And, um, you know, and also trying to get, you know, the right type of kids, the right type of mentality with that we're going to mix with the guys that we brought back from last year's team. In terms of the full off season too, did that sort of, lend its hand to being able to evaluate a little bit more extensively beyond maybe just, you know, finding the best available guys last off season and now, you know, having more time to just look at them. Okay, they're talented, but do they fit into the cultural mold? Well, I think, um, you know, uh, you never like to lose, um, but I guess if there was any silver lining of us not making it to the postseason last year as we, we were, you know, boots in the ground from day one of that transfer portal and, and had a, a plan of attack that we wanted to – try to accomplish and every new name that popped up we were had our research team going after it and trying to figure out the right guys that we had a legit legitimate chance of, uh, of bringing in and we went hard after it we knew that was our game plan versus like you said the year before you know you, you come in in the middle of the recruiting season and, and not a lot of guys that are uh, committed in that in that next class I think we had four four guys committed in the 22 class and, and no freshman arms on the roster w that we inherited so we knew we had some work to do, and uh, and quite frankly, there were, there was you know we ended up having a big turnover on the roster, which in my mind was necessity um, that we needed to do. But on the flip side of that, we knew we were going to have to dive heavy into the portal this year, and um, you know we we did in our mind we did pretty well. You know we we did okay, and there was a couple of fish that that slipped through the net there that we had on on the decks, but uh, you know the NIL stuff got us in the end, which was which was too bad, but. On the same token, we still feel we put ourselves in a much better position. In addition to that transfer portal class you guys brought in, also, I mean, you, you had a good freshman class as well. I mean, what do you, what is, how do you envision Isaiah Jackson, his impact this season? Uh, Jax has is, is been, um, you know, breath of fresh air since he's gotten here. He's done a done a great job. Um, mouth shut, works hard, and and um, you know is capable. Cap we were. were very lucky to get him through the draft you know first and foremost he was uh highly touted out of the draft where he was a potential top two three round guy um his signability i think was such to where um you know he didn't budge which which is why he slipped down to think the 18th or 19th round um but you know bottom line we were lucky to get him because he was a highly touted kid and in a realistic top two three round guy that that uh you know knew that stuck true to his guns and his his uh number so for us to get him was great, and he's done a great job on coming in and, and um, you know, playing well. And he's done a good job on uh, covering ground in the outfield. He's putting together professional at-bats, you know, it, during our inner squads. And he's done uh, done everything we've asked him to do. So he's a, he's a kid that, that has a little bit of rawness to him still, but, but is, has enough of um, – enough all-around game to where I think he's going to be very successful as a freshman and he's going to continue to get better and better and better as long as he keeps working and uh, by the time he leaves here he's going to be a, a special talent. And speaking about like guys in recruiting you mentioned a little bit ago this is kind of your first full window to go out there and recruit not only like the freshmen and but getting the transfers as well in a world where the transfer portal is so massive not only for your sport but for every sport I mean you saw the football team Kenny Dillingham went out and got a billion guys this offseason for football the, the transfer portal and recruiting that what's that like as a staff to have to go out there and not only get the young kids but go get everybody well I think there it, it's got to be a balance and based on your roster needs I think it has to be a balance because uh, you know like I said in this situation in Kenny's situation you know we, we came in with with a lot of holes that we had to fill so we had no choice but to go out and and be heavy in the transfer portal uh, moving forward I think that 
you know, this year is probably the second year. We will dabble in it, certainly, and then pr try to, to target a few more guys that, that jump in if they, if they fit our culture. Um, but I think in the long run, it's important to try to build with your freshmen um, year in and year out just because I think that sets a precedent that, you know, uh, you as a parent, right, your, your kid's going to ASU and he's got a legit shot to be the, the starting shortstop, and then all of a sudden you go out and get six transfer shortstops coming in it's like, boy, what does that say to your, what does that say to you? Um, you know, but on the same token, you know, this is a bottom line business. You're here to win. And if you feel those guys are going to come in and contribute right away, then there's not a, it's not necessarily a need to go do that. And I think uh, if you're trying to build a culture for the long, the long haul, um, you know, for me, I would like to build with our incoming freshmen year after year and use the portal as, uh, as a place just to plug a hole or two every now and again. How differently do you feel you have to coach, let's say, transfers like Luke Kisho or Ross Dunn as opposed to some of the freshmen that have come in, Newton Contratus, Luke Hill, Ryan Hanks? Is, like, what is the dynamic there, and how do, they, how do they vary? Well, I think you have to be, you know, you have to be careful because, you know, these guys are coming from good programs, you know. Um, Ross Dunn's coming from Florida State. Uh, Luke Kisho's coming from USF with, with Nino Geritano, who I know very well. And, um, you know, those guys are getting taught the right way at those programs as well. Um, so you, they're coming in, they're seasoned, they're experienced guys. Um, you know, they're just more of, of guiding them, I guess, more so than, than coaching them. And if they get a little bit off track, you know, trying to, you know, they've been through the, the battles a little bit. They've already been there and done that. So now it's just a matter of fine tuning them and letting them go because they've, they've experienced this level already. Uh, the freshmen are coming in wet behind the ears. They have no idea what they're about to experience here in the next couple weeks. And I've tried to reiterate that to them like, guys, you know, this is not little boy baseball anymore. This is you got to put your big boy pants on and, and toughen up a little bit. And, you know, it's going to get intense and it's OK. You're going to struggle at times. But, you know, the, the mentality, the body language, the attitude, that stuff can't waver. Um, you got to keep grinding and keep playing. And, um, you know, we'll see how they react when those lights come on. It'll be it'll be different for them for sure. And um, I'm anxious to see how they respond. And. You know, that's that's uh, what we've done well, I think, is we have some good veteran older guys to calm the waters if that becomes necessary. Coach, you, you mentioned a lot through the first couple media availabilities we've had at uh, uh, Phoenix Muni. On paper, y your team looks good. It looks complete. It looks filled. It feels, I think that's like admirable because it's almost as if you're doing the reporter's job, you know, on paper. You know, our team looks great, but it's not until the game start maybe that we can really see what this what this is all about. What What is your thought process behind that? Does it feel intentional to you at this point? Um, it does. Um, for me, it's, uh, you know, I trust these guys. You know, we, we, we've worked hard this off season, and, and we understand that uh, what we're up against, we understand what people think of us. You know, we understand that they're picking us to finish seventh and they're picking us to not in the top 25. Great. Perfect. We got a chip on our shoulder. We got something to prove. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, to me, that's when we're most dangerous uh, when you're trying to prove something. And, you know, are we there yet? Absolutely not. We got to have to get better each and every week and and try to improve and continue to improve and adjust, adjust the course and redo things. Um, that's just part of the nature of the beast that we're in. But um, like I said, I think we have uh, assuming when the lights come on, these guys show up and and perform like they have in the fall and the spring um, to their capabilities. And, and again, I, I try to stress to them not to do anything they're not capable of doing. Um, try to keep it simple, make the routine plays. Don't beat yourself on the mound. Don't walk guys, um, you know, attack the fastball from an offensive standpoint. Just the things that they're capable of doing, if they are able to go out and execute that way, um, I like our chances, I do. Um, now, if, if the, the lights get too bright and and you know, if things go haywire, then we're you know we're gonna have some we're gonna be on the run a little bit. So uh, bottom line, we'll, we'll see. Uh, you don't really know until until the stadium lights come on on Friday night. And just kind of speaking about that, you know, big stage atmosphere. You guys are taking a trip down to the SEC to play Mississippi State. Was that intentional to schedule that in your second year to make sure that you guys get like a little bit of a test before you enter into the Pac-12 uh, portion of your schedule? I, I I tried to do that the first year, you know, but I I, I was naive to think that the schedule had already been all done <laughs> and complete so uh, for me it's, it's important to get on the road early uh, go to a place that's going to be a tough environment and find out what you're made of and even if you uh, not that I'm anticipating losing games but even if you don't come back with wins it's important for the experience to know where you have to get to um, 
doesn't do any good to sit at home and play a cush cush schedule against people that you're going to beat up on only to the first time you experience a hostile environment in the postseason. Uh, for me, I would rather go get on the road early, find out what we're made of, find out who's going to step up in those situations, and and know okay, those are the guys we can count on when it comes. Hopefully, at the end of the season, we get into the postseason. Those are the guys we can count on because mm -hmm. they've been in that type of environment before. So um, that's important. I think it's important to do that. That's something we'll look to do each year. Is that the series, that Starkville series, that you have circled outside of the San Diego State opening series that you and everyone is waiting for, looking out for? Um, I think, you know, San Diego State is, is going to be a, a very tough test for us right off the bat. Um, I think they're we played them last year. You know, there was sparks flew a little bit with us last year, and I anticipate that, you know, maybe being the case again this year. So, um, you know, they're going to come in ready, um, and, and we gotta we got to take care of business against them first. Uh, UNLV comes in midweek. They beat the brakes off us a couple times last year, so we owe them a little something, and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll turn our attention to Mississippi State after that. But, um, you know, sure, when you look at the schedule, uh, the 56 games that we have, you certainly you circle those, and the Oklahoma State series on the road, those are, those are two very good programs that, that we're going to have our work cut out for us going on the road. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're going to get to some, some fun easy one two word answers here in a second but just the last thing with all of these new names in place now for ASU baseball who are some of the guys who you lean on I guess you should, you could say to establish the culture and have guys sort of follow behind well, I think uh, you know a couple of our returning guys uh, first and foremost you know Ryan Campos uh, is a, a great stability down there Ethan Long uh, does a great job um, you know, pitching staff, Brock Perry is a, a program guy that has, you know, been around and understand. He's named after Jim Brock, so his, his dad understands wh how important it is to, to, to carry the Sun Devil tradition the right way. Um, so, you know, some of those returners are, are important, but uh, new guys, Luke Kieschel, we mentioned before, is going to be a, you know, a main leader in that clubhouse uh, with these guys. Um, you know, Owen Stevenson on the mound, Ross Dunn. Those type of guys that are, you know, we're going to need their leadership. You know, they have experience. They've, they're older guys. They've been around. Nolan Lebemop is the guy that, the sleeper kid that we've got uh, from Valpo that, that uh, has been through the ranks and been through the wars a little bit. So uh, he'll come in and be a nice stabilizing force out of the bullpen for us. So I think we got, you know, enough older veteran guys that hopefully will keep the waters calm enough down there to where uh, hopefully the younger guys' talents can shine through and we put a mix together and hopefully it's a recipe for, for winning some games. Awesome, Willie. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us on this. Don't go anywhere. 90-second sports update coming at you right now. All right. I mean, Tom Brady made the move to Fox Sports over the weekend, retiring from the NFL after a short stint in Tampa Bay, a long stint in New England. He's going to take a break, spend some time with family. He won't join up with Fox Sports until next season. He's going to take the year off, join in 2024. Kyrie Irving been traded. He's on his way to Dallas. He'll join up with Luka Doncic. Markeith Morris is going over there with him in exchange for not Spencer Dinwiddie, Dorian Finney-Smith, a first-rounder in 2029, a couple second-rounders around that time as well. Brian Flores just got a job. He's no longer the Steelers on the Steelers' defensive staff. He's the new defensive coordinator in Minnesota, a big get for the Vikings as they try and push themselves over the gap and get themselves into Super Bowl contendency yet again. More big news as well. I'm sure as we develop throughout the day here on Furtado and Seymour at Radio Row. It's been a long day without you, my friend, and I'll tell you all about it when I see you again. Peyton and Gabe are gone, and Heat Check way. is dead. So That's right, we're back. Join Kevin, Riley, Scott, and Ryan every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. for all things college sports on Blaze Radio, blazeradioonline.com. And now, your Blaze Radio Fall 2022 starting lineup. 
at 3.30 to 4 p.m. on Wednesdays. It's a show all about sports history and trivia, hosted by some guy named Jackson Lepster who will not shut up about the 1929 Philadelphia Athletics for some reason. It's Weird with Webster. Check it out on blazeradioonline.com and follow at jacksonwebster26 on Twitter to play trivia. It's Nicholas Odell here, and I get it. It's fall. You're thinking football right now, but why worry about football on a Sunday night when you could listen to the biggest bonanza on Blaze? That's right. The college fast bonanza is back bigger and better than ever also more inclusive with more women's basketball coverage what's not to love so join me my analysts every sunday night at seven o'clock arizona time right here on blaze video online.com and make sure to follow us on twitter at college bonanza for all kinds of great college basketball content bro you ever wondered how you could get paid to watch sports or like work in sports yeah, bro, I just got done listening to this podcast with Austin Scott, Jeffrey Hinkle, and Hayden Silly. No way, bro. Yeah, bro, and it's right before NFL kickoff. No way, bro. That's right. Tune in to How To Sports every Sunday from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. What's going on, everyone? It's Daniel Pike, the host of Good Takes Only, live on Blaze Radio, 10.30 every Thursday. Each week, I give my takes on the latest NBA and NFL topics, well joined by athletes, journalists, and insiders. Make sure to tune in. Introducing the three chuckleheads of Triple Threat. Hi, I'm Harris Hicks, and I have a girlfriend named Stats. I love going on dates with her to KenPalm.com. And I'm Keith Dolly, and I have an unnatural obsession for pronouncing long names and the Southern Conference. And I'm Tyler Conrad. I hate Stats. Yes, that was a shot at Harris. Listen to Triple Threat for the best college basketball comedy and analysis. Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Arizona time on Blaze Radio. Every player wants to be the best on the court, but there can only be one. William on the drive. Pull up, pull up. Got it. She got it. Oh, Dale, good for the way. Bird in the corner. You bet. On Queen of the Court, we talk all things women's basketball. And each week, we crown the player who ruled the court. Tune in Tuesdays from 8 to 9 p.m. on blazeradioonline.com. You come here to have fun. Whee! You also come for one thing more. I'll pay you a Chipotle bowl, and Jake will pay for the chips. And of course, the hard-hitting questions. Hard to ask any of us that question. <laughs> Correct. It's for Tito and Seymour, Wednesdays from 4 to 5 on Blaze Radio, Blaze Radio Online. We're back in at Radio Row coming in here in downtown Phoenix, and let's just kind of talk about the scenery here. I mean, it's a very nice convention center. Obviously, you got all the big boys, NBC, Fox Sports, Sirius XM along the outside of this, but I like these little posters. I mean, you can't really see me here. We'll put some uh, pictures on the on the Twitter feed, but there's a lot of good Super Bowl photos up around here in LA. I've had an hour or two to take it in now. It feels like, like we're actually here. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. Like, we're here doing our thing, and uh, we're just we're just one of the many. And I mean, like, for me, I think you sent it over 200 tables. I think we talked about that just now a little bit earlier as well. But some of the names out here, NBC Sports, NBC Sports, NBC Sports Boston, the bigger RSNs, and the PFF is over here. I mean, Pro Football Talk, Chris Sims is somewhere uh, hanging around around here. So it's like there's big names every single – Bart Scott was out here earlier. Mina Kimes is out here somewhere, you'd have to imagine. The ESPN crew, Orlovsky, they're all here, and that's kind of the cool thing is it's like, hey, you gotta you gotta lay back. At the end of the day, at some point, we're a student radio station. We're a bunch of nineteen year old kids that are just like twenty. 20. I mean, let's put some. Oh, okay, on sorry. Our <laughs> my fault. My fault. I'm nineteen. They're <laughs> twenty. My bad. You, we're a bunch of kids that are out here hanging out with some of these guys, and you almost get sometimes you get a little too tense because you wanna you wanna stand up straight and sit up and prove that you belong. But sometimes you gotta just take a sit back and look around and say. Hey, there's the Super Bowl banner from Super Bowl 10. They've got all the banners from, what, 56 Super Bowls now? And Patrick Mahomes is behind us here. Jalen Hurts is just over there, not the actual people, just their pictures. 
it's it's a cool environment here at Table yeah. 90. What are we, 93? 93, with Table 93. And it, it's cool just to kind of see all this. And you look around, there's Super Bowl scenery literally everywhere. everywhere. You got logos on the fences behind us. There's obviously the posters that we've talked about. And then, like, everywhere you look, like, even on NBC's little column, it's all Super Bowl decked out. And mm-hmm. the top is the NBC stuff. So, I mean, everywhere you look, you're going to see some kind of Super Bowl letter, Super Bowl symbol, Super Bowl color. It's Super Bowl everywhere. Yeah. It's it's cool. I mean, Noah put it best. It feels like we finally arrived, and that's that's the cool thing. Yeah, a little bit different than Bill Austin. A little yeah. bit more roomy, a little bit more. Bill Austin's just great, a little though. bit different. It is great. It's a great studio, but it's mm-hmm. a little bit different once you get outside the comfort of your own studio. I can Are these enough lights for you, Jake? Is this, is this I, I'm seeing great. It's awesome. What <laughs> about you? I mean, you're the, the one. The only reason I ask is the lighting. You know, we we could go without some of the lights in uh, in the Bill Austin radio station. You don't but, like uh, the uh, LED lights? Is that what you're referring to? No, no. Because I'm a big fan of the LED lights. Well, because we we'd come in and you know the show before us, or it might might have been like a whatever it was, they would have all the lights turned off, and there was yep. a certain ambiance about it. But yep. but Jake, I, I think Jake needs to have it at a certain <laughs> lighting level. So <laughs> he would always turn it up, and I would always just sort of like squint my eyes for at least a minute or two to get adjusted. You got to have uh, the lights on. It, it helps you focus a little bit more. Uh, not, not me. Not me. Yeah, I, I, think nice. I think I'm a, uh, a bit of a vampire or whatever – you know, things that do well in the dark. Vampire. You do like to stay up towards the <laughs> later portions of the night, so I wouldn't put it past you. I yeah. really wouldn't. Per source, you heard it here live. Noah Furtado is a vampire? A night night owl? I don't know. Night you owl would be the correct owl. term. Night owl. Night vampire, owl. I would not describe anyone it's as dark. a vampire. Any, that any feels uh, th- threatening. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that. I don't know. It's just something that's, like, related to, like, keywords. Keywords to, to dark, darkness, dark lighting, whatever it is. Dim, dimness. I don't know. Can you tell that guy's a writer? <laughs> I, I can't. I can't sometimes. I mean, no, it's cool. And this is just the this is just the the front piece. It's the the big picture before it actually happens. The game itself is the big thing here, and we haven't talked enough today about Eagles Chiefs because we're going to talk about it throughout the week, so we can afford to kind of spread it out, being here all six days before the Super Bowl actually happens. But when you get to the game itself, like, what is the big thing you're looking forward to circling? In terms of the matchup, the environment, the the pageantry, anything with the Super Bowl being in what is it now six days, a little less than. I just think the biggest thing is just being among it. Like this is the first time, I'm, at least for myself, I definitely for Noah, just because there was never a Super Bowl in Hawaii. But I'm not sure about you. You moved around all over the place, but there's <laughs> never been a Super Bowl, at least for me, that it was like that I've been around. Like this is the first time I've seen all. Like even outside, we look outside our apartment, and there are people walking all over the place. You walk down the block, and all of a sudden, roads are blocked off for Super Bowl stuff. We're seeing people go out to Super Bowl experience. Like, I've never seen that in my life before. And now it's like, this is, and that's probably the part to me that it, where it's like, okay, the Super Bowl's actually happening because we're seeing people and we're seeing things happen to kind of cue that Super Bowl happening. Feels like we're actually living in a city now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Feel like there's actually stuff going on. It's, it's quite the, it, it's so different. I'm so happy that these people that are in Phoenix right now that have jettisoned in from other, other cities, other states, are trying to go to a restaurant at 10:35 at night and realizing that nothing is open <laughs> in downtown Phoenix. You know, you, you get a little you get a little bit of a drink in you and you want to go to Chipotle, right? At 10:35 and you go up and you walk up to the Chipotle at the little common area or the little area and it's like, "Oh my god, it's closed." Like uh, people are realizing that too. That's the other funny quirk cuz all these people They're here also are gonna I have to deal with this. our pain. Okay, so I actually did not know this, but <laughs> Uh, Mina Kimes, ESPN personality, she was on Twitter, and she I, and she was saying, like, what are things to do in Arizona? And people were saying, I didn't know this, Scottsdale is a dry city. There are no bars in Scottsdale, I guess. People were saying this. Is that not – that Zach Woolley is telling us that's incorrect. Zach, you want to elaborate on that? Uh, Scottsdale, especially Old Town, as, as the as the senior member of uh, <laughs> this table right now, <laughs> I will go ahead and tell you Scottsdale is very much not a dry city. Uh Arizona State is a dry campus, but we all know, <laughs> and you can't see me on air, but I got quotation but marks on that. Um, but Scottsdale's not a dry city. I mean, Old Town's really got it popping, but mm. I, I I don't know. Maybe that's good good intel. Entirely. Yeah, I saw I saw that was a discussion in the comment section there. People were a lot of people were discussing about it, which but I guess that's incorrect information. Shout out producer Zach for hopping yeah, in and rolling on out. Got you guys. Of course. <laughs> did, I no. I, did I hear it correctly? Did you slip in an inferno intel? Yeah, I said that's g- maybe that's bad intel. Perchance maybe inferno <laughs> intel. I wow. I, I mean, we're <laughs> always repping the brand. You know, I'm we're uniquely Kronka here. I'm gonna I'm gonna shut up and listen. <laughs> <laughs> Kasc Blaze Radio. That's the place to be right now. 
Where's Reno? Unifying everybody across Crown Crown. We Crown try. Crown. We Except try. Except we're in 320 now. Yeah, 320 is a big loss. For anyone who doesn't know, 320 was the Blaze Room in Cronkite. Now it's a library in Cronkite. So we lost that. So that's why we came here. You know, we couldn't just do the show inside a room. We had to come to the big time and show them who's boss. Just like Jalen Hurts might be doing on Sunday. That, that might be a sneak peek for later on in the week. But Noah sure, certainly thinks so. You big Jalen Hurts guy for this week, Noah? You expecting big things out of the Eagles? I am. I am. I, I, feel, I just feel like the Philadelphia Eagles have the right timing. Um, Whereas it's always the timing for for Kansas City, <laughs> like they they they're gonna make time for for every season to be be wherever it is that the Super Bowl is being hosted. Whereas with the Eagles, man, they just have come so far so fast. Yeah. Like there was no build up to this. I mean, you could argue with the off season moves how they set themselves up, but as far as like a season to season progression, mm -hmm. you didn't you didn't see that. You know what I mean? So yeah, now I it feels like they they have to hit right now and. And that's not to say that they're not going to be good for a while, because I think they are. But to be able to strike this fast and and to th this extent, it, it feels like they they need to need to capitalize. I think the big thing, and we've talked about this more so, and this is on the other side of it with, with Mahomes, is that we got into this discussion last week about how this is potentially a career altering game for Mahomes. Yeah. Because if you go down the fourth road, you know, right now Mahomes is in a point in his career where if he goes left and he wins Super Bowl, then that puts him on a different uh, you know, projection, right? It puts him on an right, easier path, a yes. quicker path. If he goes right and he loses, now all of a sudden you're looking at this and it's, okay, Mahomes has now lost two of his three Super Bowls. He's yeah. been in, he's one in three. It's like, what does that kind of do? And that's the biggest thing for me is that what does if Mahomes loses, how does this just affect him down the road? If Mahomes loses this game, he's got to win more to get back on that track. If he wins this one, the narrative is not that he's a great quarterback that only got over the hump that one time with what might have been his best team. It's now, okay, well, he got it that one time, and now there's been a couple of roadblocks along the way. If he wins it, it's great. It's easy. If he loses, then there's a narrative of, okay, what is Patrick Mahomes? We know he's great. He gets the applaud every Sunday, but then the big Sunday comes around, and all of a sudden it's, well, is Patrick Mahomes really the guy in the moment? Because he's prone to these moments. He's prone to making mistakes. The AFC Championship a year ago where he just kind of, brain farted the entire second half and could not get it going against the Bengals and ultimately that's why Cincinnati was in the Super Bowl a year ago. Credit to him. He got here this time. He's here again and gives himself a chance but he's the favorite this time. The Eagles might be the hot hand but they're the inexperienced hand and that means that the team who's been here before always kind of rolls in as the de facto favorite in a lot of ways. So he's got the pressure to kind of carry himself. you got to win this game. If Jalen Hurts and the Eagles lose this game, it's like, well, who the heck thought they were going to be here this time a week ago or three weeks ago or four weeks ago or a month and a half ago? No one really ever expected, even when the playoffs started, that the Eagles would be here. Someone thought San Francisco would get them, right? It's kind of that deal. So the Eagles are coming in free and loose, and sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing. Young teams have been so streaky at the Super Bowl over the years. Sometimes it's a really good thing for them. Sometimes it's exactly the worst thing that can happen for them. So that's the question mark with the Eagles. But with Mahomes and with the Chiefs, it's the expectation, the weight of being the favorite in a Super Bowl again. And the Eagles will be more free because that weight is not on them. And that's where I think Mahomes has to kind of carry it, right, is you've got to carry a team. Even with all the talent you have, you're the guy. You've got to carry it. You've got to be the guy. Let's play the game here. Who 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 is the more pressure on this year? The Chiefs or the Eagles? Kansas City. Kansas City. Right? I mean, that's I feel like that's unanimous. What do you think? Well, it it it, def it depends on how we define the pressure. Because well, it's, pr it's because pressure. Because pressure. Patrick Mahomes, no, it's not what just pressure though because Patrick it? Mahomes has now been to 5 AFC championships, right? I could I could spin it the other way and say the Philadelphia Eagles are here in this one year that has been sure. like uh, unusually great, unexpectedly great. Whereas the Chiefs are here because everyone expected them to, right? Okay, Again. Well, that's not well, true, though. Well, I'm, what I'm saying, it's not true? I don't think oh. a lot of people expected lot the lot Chiefs people, to be here. This was a retool year for Kansas City, and they got here because they've got the best quarterback in the NFL. Well, all I'm saying is they're at this stage once again, right? And you can only expect them to at least be here once or twice more. For the Eagles, you don't know how much to project this kind of success in next year, two years from now, three years from now, because it's one season at the end of the day. And that's not to take away from them. Not, not, nothing to say about that. But I'm just saying as far as how you can look at it from a fan's perspective, how much pressure might be on the Philadelphia Eagles fan base to see their team pull through than it is for the Kansas City Chiefs. It, it, they're both very high, but I just feel like I would give it right to – the Eagles, because 
Who knows if they're going to be back here? It feels like Mahomes, the Chiefs, they've proven that they can be here again and again and See again. So you're asking the same question that people were asking of Cincinnati last year, yeah. is will they get back? And that's why there's more pressure, because this could be a once-in-a-career opportunity for guys like Hurts and guys like A.J. Brown and stuff like that. But, you know, you look at this, and I just looked this up. Travis Kelsey's age, he's 33 years old. He's at a point in his career now where he's not – I think it's safe to say he's almost past his prime. He's probably on the tail end of it, so, right? But his prime is longer than a guy like Gronkowski sure, because of the way he, he had the injuries. So he might have that, three sure. or four more years. But the point is, okay, yeah, three. even if he had those three or four more years, 37. it's still coming up. And yeah, you can get the point, 37 years old. But I'm just concerned with the Chiefs is that it gets to a point where if you lose this game and now all of a sudden the narrative on Mahomes switches. It's not Mahomes is a winner. It's Mahomes a great quarterback. When he gets to that big game, he just can't finish it off. And and once you go down that except narrative, except he has at least once. Except when you go down that narrative, one for that becomes very very dangerous. If he's one for three, that's a concern. I think in my book, it's Absolutely. not baseball. You're not batting three thirty and getting in the Hall of Fame. You got to win and you got to have more success than just one out of three. I think the Kelsey point is is actually intriguing because yeah, okay, that's that's basically their best offensive weapon. And his time may be coming up in three, four years. I, I, th I still think it's two to three years, yeah. at, you know, at the very least. But they don't have – they literally got rid of Tyreek Hill before the season. And, and who knew what kind of impact that was going to bring, except it didn't. Like, this team was just as, if not better, than teams when Tyreek Hill was their number one option. Yeah. Right? So – I just want to put that in there. I understand that if they now lose Kelsey, they'll have to refuel with some other guys. But they've shown that with Patrick Mahomes at quarterback, you know, losing a guy like Tyreek Hill or Travis Kelsey, those kinds of caliber players, they'll be all right. I mean, Who? I don't know if they'll be all right at that point. Yeah. You lose caliber players. Whoa, like wait, 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 wait. Right? No, wait, wait, uh, Jay, what? They'll be all right. I think. If they lose caliber players like Kelsey and so, but this is the thing: is Mahomes is going to elevate anybody he has. But you obviously need weapons to win the Super Bowl. But they're in a position where I I think that yes, Kelsey is the most vital receiver I think to any offense in the league. I think he's the most important pass catcher of the football in the NFL. All 32 teams, there's probably 10 pass catchers on every team. That's over 300 guys. He's the most important one, right? You lose that guy, it's big deal, obviously, because whenever you lose number one at something, it's it's pretty important. But this Kansas City team that added guys like Juju Smith-Schuster and is dominating on the ground with Isaiah Pacheco and Jarek McKinnon. Well, the offensive line is incredible. It's good. Those it's guys are electric, though. That does not take away from... It's from not incredible offensive line. I think it's a top 10 O-line. I mean, that's incredible in the NFL, top 10. Uh, 30th per, or not 30th percent. I don't know. We, we had this conversation about the standard deviation a couple weeks ago. I don't yeah, understand standard deviation, pass. but <laughs> they're a high-level offensive line. They're not the Eagles O-line. They're not by far and away an awesome O-line. They're not the Cowboys O-line from Zeke's prime years. They're not this elite group. They have electrifying players. They've got Mahomes. They've got Kelsey. They've got an offense that tailors to those guys. It gets the ball out quick, and by getting the ball out quick, they set up the deep ball and they set up the opportunities to go deep to guys like Juju Smith-Schuster and anybody else. Kadarius Toney is often a short threat target. This is a different offense. They don't take the top off of you with Tyreek like they did four years ago. It's much more like the offense a year ago when they had Tyreek Hill, which was very minimal. We're going to throw it down low. We're going to let the speed of Hill go to work. We're going to let the physicality of Kelsey go to work. And they got more speed. They lost Hill. But they get a fast guy like Kadarius Tony. Pacheco is electrifying. Jarek McKinnon with the ball in his hands is the definition of fast, and they still have Kelsey to offset that with all the physical, physicality tools that he has. I think it's a well-formatted, well-placed offense that has the backing of an exceptionally talented quarterback and one of the greatest offensive minds the NFL has ever seen in Andy Reid. And I think that inherently makes your floor a lot higher if you lose a guy like Kelsey because they've got a great guy to scheme and a great a great quarterback to follow that scheme. We need to pop out a chart for Jake Seymour of uh you know superlatives and the different levels <laughs> because I swear every single show will come to an argument just because of semantics what he's Whoa. saying superstar versus what's <laughs> incredible and what's just good or what's great or You want to make that? We can make the We yeah, probably we'll should. We'll put a little gra we'll get that up by the end of the week. Jake's superlatives or Jake yeah. maybe adjectives. Jake's takes. Of. Shout out Blake Neiman. I don't know if that's the <laughs> best name for Jake, but um 
No, I, and that's a good idea. I think we should come up with that reference chart. Well, it could be like, you remember the multiplication tables where it'd be like, okay, like four, and you gotta find the four on the top. Oh, 16. That's exactly how we could do it here. Uh, I haven't done math for like the last year and a half, so I think I'm gonna pass on, on you whatever, that wherever you were, you were going kid. with that. Huh? Big thumbs up from producer Zach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Appreciate the support. Hey, I'm here for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> He's still here. <laughs> no, um, I think that's the deal is with Kansas City, if, if Kelsey ever goes, which will be in two or three years, right? Like, maybe four years because they'll give him a contract and he'll go beyond his prime. But they will start to scheme around it, and they have the quarterback, and guys are going to want to play with the quarterback always. And Tom Brady proved that better than anybody else. Absolutely. Guys will always want to play with the guy. And that, 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 sets up, that sets up the Chiefs to always kind of have good offensive weapons because they're – They've got the quarterback, they've got the coach, and that inherently will attract talented exactly. players and will develop talented players too. They've yeah, drafted extremely well. I'm just saying, if you start well. losing a guy like Kelsey, you now have to go out and get that. Yeah, guy. you got to go get a guy, and, but they've, know, they've, sure. got a prove, they've got a very good proven track record. The only guy that I can't really think of that's a skill position player that has really kind of failed, I mean, look at Sky Moore this year. He's been good. The only really guy is, is Clyde Edwards Hilaire, who that's just fair. fell off the face of the earth because Derek McKinnon and, and Pacheco, Pacheco were great. Clyde wasn't bad. He was nowhere near the level that Pacheco and, and McKinnon have hit, but they've just been better, and they filled that hole there. Look, Jake, all I'm saying is they lost Tyreek Hill, and they're in the Super Bowl right now. Oh, like, yeah. No, I'm, like not, I'm not just – They know what they're doing. I'm just saying once you start losing multiple players of that caliber, that's when you start to get it. But it's, it's a long haul. When you have a guy like Mahomes, who's not going to want to play with him? Who's not going to want to play under a, an offensive scheme that is as explosive as it always is going to be with Andy Reid? Like, that, that's all we're saying is in, in the long run – Right, Travis Kelsey, he, he's a he's a critical part of this team and, and why they've been successful. But as far as trying to minimize their window at winning championships and Super Bowls, I don't think that's necessarily fair enough to, to what they've been able to show in terms of refueling mm. and, and going at it very quickly. I just think if you look at this Kansas City Chiefs team, they're the most, I think, the most veteran team out of the two. I think that's safe to say. I don't think that's anything cross like they have guys who've been here done that yeah you know and, and have won this game right so you look at them and that's kind of the easy choice but then at the same time you look at the eagles and they're in a situation where it's hey we haven't been here before but because of that we're not gonna take it for granted either like this is very similar to the like ryan had mentioned earlier to cincinnati last season and i'd be curious to figure out like if we went back through the history of the super bowl how many of those teams made it um made it to the super bowl and let alone back-to-back -back years I can't recall a situation where that's happened, at least in my lifetime. Back to what? So, so repeat a team, the question. So a team, a team like Cincinnati yeah. or this year's Philadelphia team that haven't been here before have been and are trying to figure out how to do it. The question mark teams that got back the year after. Is no, that it's not that. About? I'm just saying that the teams that got here that were unproven. Mm -hmm. How many how many of those teams have gotten here back-to-back -back years? It's yeah, a very so like, similar situation. Yeah, the, qu the teams, that, that's what I mean, the question yeah. mark teams that have, you don't know if they'll ever get back, those kinds of teams. I mean, let's go back. So... Philadelphia this year, Cincinnati, San Francisco kind of really wasn't. Neither of those teams were question mark teams. No. If you look at San Fran and um, Tampa, certainly. Um, the Kansas City Chiefs, obviously. That's what I'm saying. Wanted. I mean, I just did that in my head. Atlanta I, I was, but Atlanta hasn't gotten back. Um, and Atlanta was really different because they were old. Yeah. Um, well, Atlanta also had, I mean, MVP Matt Ryan at that point. Yeah, well. at prime Matt Ryan. Was Kyle Shanahan. Um, the GOAT Kyle Shanahan. Um, yeah. It's, it's an interesting question. I don't think it's happened. I mean, you, you can never really count those Giants teams in the 2000s either because sure, they had sure. Eli, and it was always just like – and I guess maybe it is that Giants teams. team that beat the 17 win th – that beat the 17-0 and Patriots because they got back two, three years later. But back-to-back -back years, I mean, it's it's inherently hard to go back-to-back -back in general. Sure. Especially when there's not that provenness about you. So you're probably looking at – You'd have to pull the teams that made the Super Bowl back to back, which is a minimal group, and then have which to go. Already, yeah. I mean, were the there question marks about this team when they got here? And it's like, well, not really. Yeah, I mean. And the only team that's been back to back since the turn of the millennium is the Patriots in 03 04, and that team already won a Super Bowl. Kansas City. Point. No, I'm, I'm sorry, won it. I'm sorry. Okay, won okay, it. I was going to say, won back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I follow. Um, yeah, what I'm no. hearing is, like, you guys, to some extent, it's proving hard. my point. Yeah, no, it's hard. Yeah. We're well, going nice. along with that narrative, and I, I, I tend to agree. Is I do think that there is more pressure on Philly, but also I don't think there's more pressure on anybody in the field than Mahomes. I think he's got the weight of being successful more than anybody else, but for Philly, you never know. 
and that's where that pressure that kind of sneaks in there. Don't tell Jalen Hurts that though, man, because his his journey to this point, right? He's always trying to prove himself that much more, right? And and for good reason, you know, the starting from the background of having to go two great years yeah. at Alabama, lose the starting job in the championship, and then be a backup for another year thereafter, have to transfer. Like, this dude has the massive chip <laughs> on his shoulder, and he is the ringleader for the Philadelphia Eagles. So as far as, you know, who has the most pressure or who ha feels like the most obligated to yeah. make something happen, I, I don't think it's Mahomes. I, I, f I really do feel like it's Jalen Hurts, and it's a one-year thing. It's the first year. The iron is hot for them. So, but is that a... Fabricated chip or is that a real chip? Because we've seen so many guys master the art of fabricated chip. Does Hertz have that pressure or has Hertz created that pressure on himself? And that's what makes him so great because you can argue that. I mean, I think there was a, a video that surfaced this week about Nick Saban talking about Jalen Hurts and about how much of a, a guy he was and how much he loves Jalen and how he basically told Jalen to go to Oklahoma because that would give him the ability to manufacture that chip and yeah. he'd be working with the best athletes working with the best coach for him in order to develop as a quarterback, but also keep that chip on his shoulder because he's going to have to go there and prove it even more. Because if he goes to Maryland and doesn't succeed, it's like, oh, wait, yeah, he went to Maryland. If he goes to another school and doesn't succeed, he went to another school. If he goes to Oklahoma and doesn't succeed, it's bad. He's not getting drafted. But he chose to go to Oklahoma to, A, get better as a quarterback, B, to keep that chip, keep that pressure to succeed on his shoulder, and that feels in a lot of ways manufactured, and that's what all the greats are good at. Michael Jordan was fantastic at manufacturing that chip on his shoulder. Is Hurts manufacturing that chip, or is there a real chip? And I think the real chip, the real pressure, is on Mahomes. But Hurts can create any narrative he wants, and he's really good at putting that in his head and saying, I got to do this. I got to do it now. I may never get that chance. And it's right, but also... It, it's yeah. and more fake. And that's the million-dollar question, right, this entire week that we're going to probably circle and come back to a thousand times from now until Sunday is the fact that is Ch is Hurts going to be able to not only manage this chip so it doesn't get too big, but be able to use it in a way to continue to motivate himself uh, throughout the rest of the season. He'll be fine. I, I just – I don't think that, he's, that it's manufactured. I think when you have media going out and finding it for him, that makes it easier and it sort of gives some validation to the fact that it is real – and just keep this in mind, man. Patrick Mahomes, the pressure he's on is how much more great can he be. It's not, is he great? Jalen Hurts, is he great? It's one season, and I think the fact that it is, it, it, there's still question marks as to the longevity of how this play will turn out one year from now, two years, three years, four years, five years. And so that pressure, I feel, has a greater magnitude than someone just trying to take that little bit more uh, over the top to be, you know, maybe a little bit more of the best player. You know, you know what I'm trying to say? So that that's all I'm saying is just hurts. He is it's it's early on for him and he and he still feels like he needs to be established. Mahomes is already there, right? Yeah. And so what you're trying to say for Mahomes is legacy wise, okay, well maybe this does have implications for that, but how much more pressure does that put on him really? He he's here. Everyone knows that he is one of if not the best quarterback in the league, right? Jalen Hurts is here unexpectedly, right? <laughs> yeah. And what, what is he going to do? So that that's all I'm saying is the discrepancy there. My point is, though, with Mahomes, that what if he just becomes another Dan Marino, a guy who is a great he is, quarterback? He is well, he's already above Dan. He is nowhere. He's already above Dan yeah. in some ways. Yeah. yeah, of course. But I'm just saying you could go fall down that yeah, yeah, yeah. similar it's, narrative. It's that Jim Kelly, Dan Marino fear of what if. And we know Mahomes. Mahomes with one ring is still on the same platform as Marino and Kelly in some aspects because there is still that what if. Like, we could have had this, but we only got this. And, again, Patrick will probably be in this scenario two or three more times in his career. He'll get back to the big game three or four more times, you'd have to imagine. So, and I just committed the cardinal sin of journalism by calling it the big game. So, um, yeah, nice done. I apologize. But uh, <laughs> Zach was uh, itching to get back on there for a second. He's going to refrain. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, that's, that's uh, again, we're, we'll have another, we'll have five more days to talk about the fact that it's a big game for two guys that one guy in terms of a fork in the road game, the other guy in terms of a will he be getting here again type thing. Getting to the road, I think, is, yeah. is, is what you're talking about with Jalen Hurts. And, th and that, in my opinion, gives more. It's a chance for Mahomes to continue his journey. It's a chance for Hurts to start his. Right. Start well, his in terms of, you know, being Success. on the same playing yeah. field as, as elite quarterbacks in the NFL. You but know I what I'm think saying? with with Hurts, it's it's for him. It's a 
prove it. I belong here because it's the narrative has been with him is that yes, he he looks like a good quarterback on paper, but ha- can he get those results? And this is the first year he's getting those results. So is this going to be a situation where if he wins this game, it's like okay, I just proved everyone wrong, and then what's next? You know what I mean? Like you got if you win this game, you got to bounce back arguably more than than if you had lost it because you have to you you got to match that, and yeah. the only way to match that is to win. It's like anything. We can you, you can twist it any different way. There's going to be well, pressure on radio. someone. We, twist it. we got all week to do this. <laughs> he right. had to get in. Is that's talk radio, folks? No, I, it, we got a whole week, and that's the beauty of it. Is we're going to be here every single day. We're going to be talking probably about the same exact thing every single day because clearly Noah's on one bridge, Jake's on another. I'm somewhere in between, maybe more on Noah's bridge. We we'll figure that out. It's like. We're going to have this to talk about all week long. Are we going to build the bridges together? Are we going to become one big bridge? How, how many Super Bowls has Tom Brady lost in his career? And granted, it's much longer, right? But but Super Bowls are lost, right, yeah, by great quarterbacks. It, yeah. it doesn't necessarily mean that there's – I just don't buy the, the career-altering well, outcome. It is what it is. Jake Seymour, big bridge guy. Are we, I'm just saying, are we going to connect the bridges together? Are we going to be able to walk along the different takes? No, uh, I'm, I'm good where I'm at. He's good. <laughs> wow. So Noah will not be building bridges this week. That is um, something we've learned. Nothing at all. What else we got? I uh, know. I'm just excited to still be here. I mean, the first day here and kind of seeing everything. And it's funny because there's always something going on. Like, it's like you're looking at Ryan. He's talking. I look over at Noah. He's, Noah's talking. And then all of a sudden, like, three people walk by. Yeah. And you're like, who's walking by? And you're like, oh, my gosh. There's uh, Ian Rappaport. It's like, <laughs> hey, there he is. There's Zach Woolley. There's Willie Bloomquist. Jeremy Hawks in that Michael Caratanuto in the house. Everyone is kind of rolling yeah, you around. You see people that you know, and then you see other people yeah. that you don't know, or you just know on TV or whatever. Michael Felger. Yeah. Your icon. No, you're your idol. Jake is so excited to be here, as this we all like, are. Yeah, we're all excited. But Jake to be here. is that ne- as Noah opened the show with. Jake's on a different plane of existence right now. Yeah, I mean this is this is great. I mean you look around, it's radio everywhere. I mean, <laughs> it, it's it's it'd be like calling the game. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. The only thing I think we need is we need the big banner. Behind us, I think that's coming well, soon. Well, they said not to bring those, so I don't know. What? I, I mean, uh, really everyone has brought one. I wish we could turn this camera right now. Inside yeah. sources, uh, sources being myself, <laughs> the banner will be hung tomorrow. Banner will be hung tomorrow. So, um, I feel like uh, the Houston Rockets in 1994, the Houston Astros in 2023. Producer Zach, stay on for a second. Your H-town guy, Jalen Hurts. I know, big Beaumont guy. I, y- everybody's talking about his relationship with his dad, Avion Hertz, who was his coach in high school. Channel View's really not known for their football okay. prowess, but when he was there, they were really good. I'm looking forward to chunking up the deuce with my boy. Uh, <laughs> let's go, man. H Town till I drown. You know the vibes. <laughs> Everybody who knows me knows how I'm feeling right now. But go, birds. <laughs> well, that's been for Title and Super First Day live at Radio Row. We'll be back tomorrow, 5 to 8 in our normal time slot, three hours of pure joy on the talk radio platform but pure joy pure joy we're looking forward <laughs> to it live that's from radio new. row that's new from jake yeah yeah we'll put that on the on the chart later on today yes. but <laughs> it's been for title and steamer live from radio row we'll sketch you guys next time